Hello everybody, today we're going to talk about part of chapter six in the sensory motor system, and this short video will be on somatosensation. Somatosensation is the sense of touch um, and refers to the sensation of body and its movements. Somatosensation or somatosensory receptors are quite different. Um, you can see this is like a little cross-section of skin, and there are many different receptors in our skin that respond to different types of uh, sensations, different types of touch. And you can see here, we've got Merkel's discs, those respond to touch, Meisner's corpuscles or respond to a different type of touch, hair follicles also respond to touch. The Pacinian corpuscle responds to pressure down here. The Raffinian corpuscle responds to stretch. And so you can see all of these different types of um, receptors are embedded in the skin, allowing us to feel all different types of sensations. And you can see here um, also heat, pain, tickle, all sorts of things. The one particular receptor we'll talk about is the Pacinian corpuscle. That's the one down here. And that responds uh, best to sudden displacement of the skin or to high frequency vibrations on the skin, moving your skin back and forth. They respond only briefly to steady pressure on the skin. There are other um, receptors that respond to pressure. You can see that they look a little bit like an onion, layers of an onion, and that outer structure provides a mechanical support to the neuron that's inside um, so that a sudden stimulus can bend it, um, but a sustained stimulus cannot. And so for the Pacinian corpuscle, it detects, like we said, sudden displacement or high frequency skin vibrations. And what how it works again this is a receptor in the skin that mechanical pressure bends the membrane again something's pushing down on this um, somebody's touching your hand or vibrating your hand um, and so the membrane is bent um, which opens sodium channels so here's the membrane at rest and we've got sodium outside the cell um, not a lot of sodium inside the cell, and these channels are closed. Um, but when the membrane is excited or stretched, or stretched, or there's pressure, the channels open and sodium goes into the cell. What do we know about an action potential? When sodium enters the cell, um, you get uh, the inside of the cell starts to depolarize or get more positive. Remember, we're at a um, arresting potential and when there's a little bit of sodium that comes in you get a graded generator potential to a moderate stimulus again you get a larger generated potential but it's graded in size and then if you hit um, if you have a strong enough stimulus in which enough sodium enters the cell you hit this threshold of excitation that's the dotted line there and generate an action potential. And the action potential is the message that's sent to the brain saying, oh, something has um, vibrated my skin. Um, and it's the increase, uh, increases in the flow of sodium ions that triggers the action potential. Somatosensation, so how does this input get to the spinal cord and brain? It's got to go from your skin, maybe your hand or your leg, and then the information has to go up into the brain. Um, somatosensory cortex is our final um, destination, and it, it receives information from the contralateral side of the body, meaning sensory information from the right side of your body is processed by your left somatosensory cortex and information from the left side of your body is processed by the right somatosensory cortex. Um, each sensory system has a distinct pathway um, from the periphery, so from your body to the central nervous system. And for somatosensation, it's the dorsum column um, that delivers touch information. So receptors in your skin send their axons um, via the dorsal roots of the spinal cord. Remember dorsal meaning back, so they come in through the back of the spinal cord. Send information up the spinal cord 
um, and synapse on neurons uh, eventually in your brain stems. They cross, you can see as they're coming, as these axons come up the spinal cord, they cross the midline. So it, information from, again, this is the right side of the body comes up into the dorsal root of the spinal cord, crosses over eventually to the left um, part of the uh, brain stem and into the thalamus. Um, and remember, the thalamus is our sensory relay station. So sensory information pretty much all goes through the thalamus. And then sent, and, and different um, sensory information is sent to a different region of the thalamus. Um, and the thalamus does some job of either emphasizing or suppressing certain sensory information. So sensory information goes from the periphery up the spinal cord in the dorsal column, the back side, they come in through the dorsal roots. We learned about that in the beginning of class. Um, then in the brain stem, the medulla, we get a crossover through the midline, midline shift, and then up into um, the midbrain where the thalamus is, and then eventually we're going to get to primary somatosensory cortex. So sensory cortex is highly organized. Primary sensory cortex, that's the first place sensory information is processed. Um, and there's one that exists for each different modality. So sensory, primary sensory cortex is S1, like we had V1 um, for vision. It's located in the post-central gyrus. And the, this is the, uh, the central gyrus. Um, differentiates your frontal lobe from your parietal lobe. So when we say post-central gyrus, this is in the parietal lobe, the very, very front part of the parietal lobe, and we'll look at a picture of that in a second. And this receives touch information from the opposite side of the body. S1 cells are arranged as a map of your body, and we call this a sensory homunculus. All right, here's our pictures. Um, so here's our side view of a brain. Um, here's the front, frontal lobe. Here's the occipital lobe. Here's the cerebellum. Here is the central uh, sulcus dividing the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe. And it's this first strip of um, this first kind of bump, the central uh, sulcus, that is the first part of the parietal lobe. Again, the parietal lobe would head this way. It's kind of in this area. Um, that, and this part right here is um, the frontal lobe. And this is going to be your primary motor cortex, as we're going to see um, in our next lecture. But right here, the very front of the parietal lobe is your primary uh, sensory cortex. And it's arranged in... Um, basically as a map of your body and you can see that each part of your body is mapped on to a part this is the blue part here is sort of over here um, so here's touch information from the chin is processed here touch information from your lower lip your upper lip your face your nose it's sort of in order from um, your head right um, nose eyes then we go to hands thumb, fingers, hand, arm, elbow, and then this part here, um, neck, shoulder, uh, trunk, and then this is the kind of going inwards, in towards the um, center of the brain, um, the hemisphere, kind of like dividing the hemispheres, leg, foot, toes, and genitalia. And what you can see is that information where we need to process or we do process very detailed touch information, for instance, your hands, processes very, what, how, what do we use our hands for? Mostly to touch and to get information from touch by using our hand. That has a, a large representation on the somatosensory cortex. There's a lot of 
cells that are um, dedicated to that, giving us much greater ability to detect touch information from our hand compared to something where we don't really use it for touch, like let's say our nose, right? You don't really get a lot of touch information from your nose, and so there's a much smaller representation. And this is the homunculus, as they talk about, where if you were to take um, all of the pieces uh, or all of the sections of the brain and or of the sensory cortex and draw a person who has the parts of their body kind of equally represented to the size of the part of the sensory cortex that is dedicated to it, you get a, a person that looks like this, where obviously the hands and fingers, um, which we use mostly for touch, have the biggest representation. Things like I said, the nose, very small amount of representation. That's the sensory homunculus. Um, the non-primary sensory cortex or secondary sensory cortex receives projections from primary secondary cortex. Um, and these sensory brain regions can influence each other. And we even have what's called association areas that process inputs from different uh, sensory modalities. Polymodal neurons process input from different sensory modalities and because there's this cross communication, this association, sometimes we see some different disorders or different conditions, one called synesthesia, where a stimulus in one modality also creates a sensation in another. So seeing something uh, might cause someone to hear a particular sound or see a particular color when they hear a particular sound. Basically, it's a condition in which um, um, information coming in, in one from one sensory modality causes um, a secondary modality to be active as well. Um, other types of sensations, one that's particularly um, interesting and gets a lot of attention is transmission of pain and perception of pain. Um, so with pain, for moderate pain, axons release the neurotransmitter glutamate, and for stronger pain, axons release glutamate and something called substance P. And mice without substance P cannot detect severe injury. Um, the receptors in our skin, these nociceptors, are um, the receptors that respond to painful stimuli. How do we reduce pain? We have a mechanism in our brain that actually reduces pain. This is called endorphins. Many of you have heard of endorphins. Um, some people say they feel their endorphins kick in after a long workout or a long run. I can't say I've ever had that experience, but hey, I've heard it happens. Um, and so endorphins are a group of chemicals that attach to the same brain receptors as morphine. So we've got here our opiate receptors. That's what morphine um, triggers to cause, lead to pain relief. And so do our endogenous opiates called endorphins. And those are uh, basically different neurotransmitters. They're the enkephalin transmitters. There's met enkephalin and lu enkephalin. These are endogenous pain relieving neurotransmitters and they bind to opiate receptors. And so you can see here we've got some kind of painful stimulus that's been sent from maybe our finger. We touched something that hurt us and a pain signal is being sent up here through this axon to the um, presynaptic terminal and this is a pain receptor so it is releasing substance P. Substance P is a pain uh, neurotransmitter. Substance P is binding here and we're getting a pain signal sent. But endorphins are stimulated by pain as well, particularly long, um, chronic, sorry, inescapable pain. Um, so pain after long distance running, um, and uh, exercises and things like that. So at some point, these this receptor that releases the endorphins start to release the endorphins. So the pain signal is going, that triggers these endorphins to be released, 
bind to the opiate receptors and those stop um, or start to block the release of substance P. So then that stops this neurotransmitter from releasing substance P and hence the pain signal doesn't get sent. Particularly, sorry, that keeps happening. Um, particularly, this um, endorphins are released in what we call the periaqueductal gray area. I'm going to show you where that is um, in a second. Another type of pain is painful heat, and there are special heat receptors that are associated with pain from a burn. Um, capsaicin is a chemical that's found in hot chili peppers that directly. Uh, stimulate these receptors and also trigger the increased release of substance P. So capsaicin um, from chili peppers, that's why when you eat it, it almost feels like your mouth is burning um, because it also triggers the same heat receptors that would be triggered with an actual burn. Um, but capsaicin leaves you temporarily insensitive to pain because neurons quickly de are depleted of substance P. What happens is um, when you eat a chili pepper, um, it activates the receptors that release substance P, but it releases all the neurotransmitter pretty much at once. And then it takes a while for that cell to build up substance P again. And so you're for a while temporarily kind of insensitive to pain, which is why the first bite of something really spicy might make your mouth burn. And then after a while, you're sort of insensitive to it. It doesn't bother you anymore. You've depleted all the substance P. Um, and the receptor there is this uh, TRPV1 receptor that detects painful heat. And this receptor also binds capsaicin. Um, the anterolateral system transmits sensation of pain and temperature to the brain. You can see here, um, nerve fibers send axons again into the dorsal horns of the spinal cord. So pain information comes in again through the back, the dorsal horns of the spinal cord. They synapse on spinal nerves that project across the midline, so it crosses pretty early um, in the spinal cord and then go up through the thalamus um, and then into the brain. And within the spinal cord, glutamate and substance P are released, then they can boost the pain signals to make it even more clear. Obviously, um, pain signals are very important for self uh, preservation and if you are unable to feel pain and there are disorders congenital disorders where people are born insensitive to pain they don't aren't able to send those signals um, that's very dangerous because you can have your hand on a burning stove and not feel that your hand is burning that can or break a, a limb and not feel the pain and these or have a big cut and have an infection and not feel that. And so these can be very dangerous disorders. So it's important that these pain messages um, get sent to our brain for our survival. Uh, here you go. Here's the paraaqueductal gray right here. Um, again, this is a side view of the brain. Here's the spinal cord. This is the hind brain. You've got the medulla and the pons right here in the cerebellum. And so you can see the periaqueductal gray there that releases endorphin that's pretty close to the um, brain stem region of the brain. Emotional pain is a whole other type of pain. We will talk about this. Um, emotional pain activates different parts of the brain called the hypothalamus, the amygdala, and the cingulate gyrus. And that leads to the emotional aspect of pain, not the actual sensation of pain. And when we talk about emotions, we'll discuss that. Pain control can be very difficult. Um, there is such a thing called the gait control theory of pain that says there are some spinal gates that are modulation sites that basically control how much pain signal goes to the brain. And so we need to try to close those gates in the spine to not allow the pain signal to the brain. And analgesia is the absence or reduction of pain. So what do we use to reduce pain? Opiate drugs. 
um, morphine and things like that, as well as endogenous opiates like we talked to the uh, talked about the endorphins bind to specific re receptors in the brain and they reduce pain. Um, an epidural, that's an injection that places opiates directly into your spinal cord that reduces pain. Uh, transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation or TENS. This is um, a pain reduction technique that stimulates nerves around the source of the pain and that seems to reduce pain. We also see a pretty strong placebo effect with pain that when people believe they're being treated for pain, even if it isn't an actually active medication or treatment, um, pain seems to um, to be relieved. Distraction is another technique. We see actual effects of distraction, and you might have noticed this yourself um, if you're not feeling well or you have a really bad headache, um, and then you go do something like you have to go to work or you have uh, go out with friends, your headache kind of goes away. You just distract it, and then when you come back home and you're focusing again, that headache might come back. Um, or in sports games and sports events, maybe people hurt themselves and um, don't even realize it. Um, so we do see that distraction um, and getting your mind elsewhere actually seems to be able to close some of those um, gates allowing the signal um, of pain to the brain. And then acupuncture, that relieves pain by inducing um, more endorphin release. All right. Well, thank you very much.